Prior to beginning the activity, please be sure to review the faculty information and disclosure statements, as well as the learning objectives. After listening to the activity, complete the post-test by clicking the Earn Credit link in the episode description. Downloadable slides and resources are also available. The following presentation is copyrighted by Medscape. No use, broadcast, or recording of this presentation or any part thereof is permitted without the written authorization of Medscape. The following presentation is part of a certified educational activity provided by Medscape Education and supported by an educational grant from GlaxoSmithKline. This program is presented by Medscape Education Global. Hello and uh, welcome to the program Where Are We Now in Managing SLE Patients with COVID-19. My name is Ronald van Bollenhoven. I'm a professor of rheumatology in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And it's my great pleasure to be doing this program here together with my colleague, Professor Marta Mosca from the University of Pisa in Pisa in Italy. And this is actually the second of a two-part program, which started back in May, when we met and discussed the situation of patients with SLE in the context of what was then the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. The peak in the countries where Marta Mosca and I work in Italy and in the Netherlands and in many other European countries. Of course, in other parts of the world, it has been different with the initial outbreak in China and also currently still outbreaks in many other countries of the world. Um, however, for us, we passed the peak of the first epidemic and in the meantime, we also have learned quite a lot of things, so I think it's very timely that today we will reflect again on what the situation is for our patients with SLE, those who may be at special risk for COVID-19 infection, where there are questions about the medications, and there are also some interesting developments in how we provide care to our patients with rheumatological diseases, autoimmune diseases, and particularly, of course, SLE. Now, from the start of this pandemic, it was clear that we needed information. And large organizations all over the world have actually um, taken up this challenge. And one of those organizations, of course, is the European League Against Rheumatism, EULAR, which um, started a database for COVID-infected patients who already had a rheumatological disease. And this large database has been growing by leaps and bounds and now includes more than 2,400 patients and is being followed and expanded to learn more about how things are going. Of these patients, some have systemic lupus erythematosus. Of course, that's not the biggest group. It's mostly rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic, spondyloarthritis, but there are those with SLE as their disease in the background and then the COVID-19 infection. And some information is now emerging about what kind of medications were they on, what kind of symptoms that they present with. And then of course, it will be very important to see how they have done. Now this eular based registry is not the only one. And I would like to ask you, Marta Mosca, what can you tell us about other registries in the world or in specific countries? So um, we, we have many registries, but the effort that has been made over these weeks, I would say, few months it has been to try to collect all the cases together so we did not have duplications so uh, we had a registry in Italy uh, there was a EULA registry but in the end we have a global rheumatology alliance so that we have collected all cases together so that we learn more by having our patients together the Global Rheumatology Alliance Registry, in fact, has collected um, an average of 600 cases now. So now we're starting to see what happens to patients with uh, uh, rheumatic diseases, different rheumatic diseases and lupus uh, of our interest. And uh, we have learned that about half of the patients are hospitalized. And uh, it looks like among those patients who were hospitalized, uh, maybe um, a little bit more patients with lupus were represented than patients with vasculitis. But for sure, these data have to be studied and analyzed more deeply. So this is just an idea. 
and uh, but we're learning a lot we're learning a lot and but this is not the only registry we have because uh, in other countries there have been analyses uh, such as those who have which have been made by the Biobadaser registry in Spain and uh, this registry actually was focused on understanding the impact of treatment on the uh, disease, um, disease severity, to understand whether patients with uh, DMARDS were at higher risk of having uh, adverse events uh, if they were infected by corona uh, and maybe also on their hospitalization rate. The Biobadazer registry gave us a very important information because it looks like that um, the immune suppressive medications are not going to, are not increasing actually the risks for our patients. And this has a big impact for patients with rheumatic diseases, but for patients with lupus, it's very important to know that. Yes, and Mar Marta, I think that was one of the big, big questions that we all had when this uh, started emerging, that do the immunosuppressives put patients at risk of being infected with the COVID-19 virus or uh, of having a more severe disease course. And so what you're saying is that so far the news is reassuring? What do you yes, think? Yes, it is. It is very reassuring. It is very reassuring and it says very loudly that our patients shouldn't stop their treatment and we should start treatment if needed for patients with lupus. If they have to be treated, they have to be treated as we used to do before COVID. Uh, so we have to use that treatment safely um, in today and tomorrow in our clinics with our patients. So it doesn't look like the immunosuppressive medications worsen the, um, the, the disease course or have an impact on our patients. Well, that is good news. And then, of course, it's interesting that immunosuppressives is one part of the treatment of uh, systemic lupus. Of course, we use other kinds of medications also. And the medication that has had the most um, interest all across the world has, of course, been hydroxychloroquine, or generally speaking, the anti-malarials. And uh, what do we know now about the anti-malarials in the context of the COVID-19 epidemic? It started like the, the treatment or so one of the major things we could use. Everyone, I mean, wanted to be on Plaquenil at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, a patients, for example, were so happy to be taking Plaquenil because they felt they were protected. But now we know the more, the more data come out, the more we know that probably it was a little bit overestimated. And, uh, and also the arms of trials, uh, including Plaquenil now have been stopped. So even from, uh, from trials, it looks like uh, it, it is not as we thought with Plaquenil. We mm -hmm. know that it's very good for lupus though. So uh, It's still a very I, good drug for our patients, right? And yes, so it, it, it was a worry that maybe they wouldn't be able to get the drug yes, because there yes, was so yes, much yes. demand. That's probably not the case now. And um, of course, I do think that the trial that was testing hydroxychloroquine, it actually stopped and then started again. So we'll see at some point we'll know, but so far it doesn't look like it's such a great promise. Interesting though, that uh, we of course use corticosteroids a lot for lupus and other rheumatological diseases. And dexamethasone actually has emerged as something that can help the patients with the most critical form of COVID-19 in the intensive care unit. And then I wanted to ask you, Marta, about the, the last category of medications for lupus, the biologicals. Of course, uh, there's not so many biologicals um, that are specifically approved for systemic lupus, just one, belimumab. Some are used off-label in some situations, but in general, can you say something about what we know and can they see safely be used? Should they be continued? Are there any specific, specific concerns? Well, we know very little, but there are no specific concerns. So the advice, and uh, if, if, even if we go through the recommendations and the guidelines we're now having from our societies, the, uh, the message is that we should start treatment, for example, with belimumab in patients who need. So there is not a specific um, sign of risk for patients treated with this drug. Uh, so we should continue and start the treatment as required by lupus. Mm -hmm. Uh, by the Just treat as you would always do. And you already mentioned it, the ACR, the American College of Rheumatology, has issued uh, guidelines. Can you yes. say something about what, what do they tell us? 
Yes, we have uh, guidelines from the ACR and from EULA. Uh, these are uh, actually living documents. Uh, both uh, guidelines are changing very fast. Uh, because uh, because we're learning lots of things and we are getting information one day after the other. Uh, and uh, the um, ACR guidelines actually um, um, discuss preventive measures for patients with uh, rheumatic diseases and support the fact that our patients should follow the preventive measures suggested to the general population, but uh, we might want to reduce the access to the hospital. So try to find a way to reduce their visits to the clinic. Uh, as far as treatments are concerned in the ACR, these are very thoroughly analyzed. Uh, different treatments are considered with a specific note on lupus. So that we have some information for lupus uh, um, with the ACR recommendations. In fact, uh, in the treatment of lupus, we find that specific recommendations have been released, um, saying, telling us that in newly diagnosed um, diseases, we should do obviously treatment, we should start treatment with hydroxychloroquine, and that in patients with pregnant patients, hydroxychloroquine should be continued, and if indicated, belimumab might be initiated. So this is very important. The other very important thing is that steroids should not be stopped even in the presence of patients with COVID infection. If patients are chronically treated, should not be stopped um, one day after the other abruptly because this is dangerous for our patients. So low doses of steroids should be continued. Uh, and and uh, these messages, I think they are strongly, could be associated with the EULAR provisional recommendations because EULAR tell us about even patients who have been in contact with uh, COVID infected patients and they, these recommendations suggest what to do in these cases, uh, for example, to test our patients if they have um, living people, they live with people who have been infected, to consider uh, whether the treatment should be stopped in positive but asymptomatic patients, which is a, is a point we don't know. We know many patients are asymptomatic, but they get the infection. And what should we do? Should we stop the treatment? Should we continue the treatment? This has to be discussed patient by patient and based on the treatment. So I think these two sets of recommendations in a way integrate because they cover slightly different things. The, what emerges very, um, very interesting is that the treatment of, the, of patients uh, with rheumatic diseases and COVID is not, it's not just a matter of the infectious disease doctor, the pneumologist, but it's a team who has to be involved with, in that. And the rheumatologist has a role that is not the only doctor. The pneumologist has a role is not the only doctor because these are very complex diseases. And these are also very useful guidelines uh, for all of those, those taking care of the patients. Yes. I just wanted to finally also talk a little bit about how we give care because uh, certainly um, here in Amsterdam and I think all across uh, our world of rheumatology, we've been implementing ways of giving care that are very different from what we used to do. At some point, we were providing 80 to 90 percent of our care remotely, telephone or video conferencing with the patients. That seemed a bit too much in the end. We're now aiming for about 50 percent. Is that the development that you've seen uh, where you work, Marta? Is that something that's happening generally, telemedicine? Yes, it is. Not only for rheumatology, but for everyone now in the clinic. So we've done the same phone calls and telemedicine if it was possible seeing patients. During the emergency, this was very well accepted by patients. Patients were very happy to be contacted by us. They were scared, they were worried. They really needed to have a contact with the clinic. But now that we are not in an emergency anymore, what I see is that many patients, they want to come back to the clinic. So yeah. we need to increase the number of visits in the clinic now. And uh, we aim at uh, more than 50% because patients mm -hmm. really, they want, it, they want yeah. to come back. So the personal contact is always... Yeah. Yes, they do. Irreplaceable, but we can do a, we can do yeah. a little bit more than we thought, yeah. I think. Yes, yeah. so I think... Technologies. Yeah. It is. So I think we will see patients maybe once and then we will discuss with them the frequency of telemedicine maybe for the next assessment. But now everyone is in need of coming back to the clinic as we are to see our patients. Yes, we want to see them too. Yeah. So 
um, I think that that is actually a very interesting development with a lot of positive aspects. Of course, the fact is that nobody asked for a pandemic and there is still a very, very big challenge ahead of us. I think for our patients with SLE, there is some good news in that the treatments do seem to be fairly safe in this context and that the patients can be treated and the risk is not excessive. Of course, the patients with SLE have to be careful, just like we all do have to be careful. We will probably be living with COVID-19 for quite a long time. There's been speculation about herd immunity emerging, but it doesn't seem to be happening very fast. There is hope for a vaccine, but nobody knows for sure if it can be done and how long it will take before it can be developed, tested, of course, and then also implement on a very large scale. So we're going to be dealing with this problem for a long time and we're going to keep you updated. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Marta Mosca, for being here with me today in this program. <laughs> thank and you very thank, much. <laughs> and thank you all who have uh, listened and um, a, a good luck in the future with COVID-19, with treating patients with SLE. Thank you very much. This program was presented by Medscape Education Global.